So let's start. Thanks for coming in the afternoon after having lunch. And I will make it short. Or just tell me if it's getting too long. But I only have 10 slides, and it's just a rough overview of a part of things you can do with a micropilot. Um, <coughs> so it's a technical lecture to the aspect of micropilot aspiration. And um, so that's the workshop which is just going on, and it's a very basic technique, so there's not too much uh, theory behind. And yeah, I will just guide you a bit through what happened in the last like, 50 years. Um, here you just see one example, it's from my diploma work. Um, sorry for the bad image quality, but it was a crop from a VHS tape. So um, that's how we did first how I started doing analysis. Um, and here you just see the use of a micropipette, which is a quite common use, just to hold things. So this is a lymphocyte, a non-adherent cell. And if you want to pull membrane tubes from such a thing to get an idea about the membrane adhesion to the cytoskeleton, um, you can use a micropipette, for example, gently aspirate the cell, and then you can fix it in, in space and move it around and use the other side as a fixed handle, the optical tweezer, to just pull out tubes. But that's just one of the examples. So, in fact, micro, so micropipet aspiration, or any you know, like pipet aspiration, biological sciences, there's two major fields which I will not cover, and where micropipets are used a lot. So the one part is in neuroscience, in the whole patch clamp uh, business. Um, you can go down, and it started with like, okay, I clamp whole cells, and you can now even go down and clamping so small membrane areas where you say, okay, you only have a single channel, and then you can just try and, and test out how the channel works and um, applying stimuli and then measuring currents going from the inside of the cell to the pipette and vice versa. Another large field is the uh, whole field of genetics where people use pipettes to inject genes or gene material uh, into oocytes or into emptied um, egg cells uh, to fertilize in vitro animals or to produce clones or whatever. So I will more talk about such things um, where you, so this I just got from the internet, but so um, where you use the microfiber to aspirate either vesicles as it is shown here or cells uh, to get some information about what's going on on the membrane and what's going on on the cytoskeleton. So just the principal key elements, how to set up the system, uh, for those who are not participating in the workshop. Um, so as I said, it's a quite low-tech um, technique, I would say. So you need pipe it, which is made out of glass normally, so because you can nicely image through glass and you can, uh, chemically, it's good for working with biological samples. So we normally use borosilicate glass and the uh, capillaries we use as starting material, about one to 1.5 millimeter in diameter, depending just on how your holder is constructed. And um, then you need a pipe holder. And uh, most important is that it is a stable thing and that it tightly connects the glass capillary to your rest of the tubing. The solder, and there will be a little sketch also. There. The solder is normally installed on a micro manipulator so that you can manipulate and then can, that you can guide your micro pipette uh, on a controlled manner. Best is here to have some way of motorization because uh, your hand is shaky. And even if you're just screwing a screw, you will shake around. This can, this can uh, perturb your measures. So you, you want to have it as stable as possible. And normally, those three things are also then installed directly on the microscope stage. And then uh, to be able to play around with the pipe and to apply pressure or suction pressure, you have to connect the pipe to your pressure control. So you use tubing and valves. Normally, you use some flexible plastic tubes. And again, it's very important that everything is tight, because otherwise, all your pressure estimations are wrong. And then it's, as pressure control, you can just use a simple water vessel, a vessel filled with water, and the 
installed on a height adjustment, so like a ratchet rack, uh, ratchet rod. Uh, you can also, for rough cleanings, for example, you add also a syringe, so where you can just press and push. And uh, if you are more sophisticated, you can also use an automated pneumatic system, which enables you to change pressures in an automated way. Uh, these are like the, the central things you need. And just some examples how things look like in the lab, how they can look, let's say like this. So this is just my, this was my pressure control, for example, in Paris. Uh, here's just a water bath. It's a little bucket connected to the tubes. The other side is also a syringe. So you have both connected to the same pipe. Just uh, you put the wharf in between so that you can select between syringe and water bath. So this can be then used, the syringe can be used to clean the pipe. And everything is installed. Um, so there's one final adjustment which is uh, given by these uh, micrometer uh, screws so that you that allows you to adjust the height on an in, in a, with a position of micrometers and then for the large movements we have everything ins installed on a ratchet rod so that you can easily make moves of several centimeters yeah, so we have a combination of large scale movement and small scale movement and then just that you see so this is a micro manipulator with the uh, holding mechanisms and this direct at the microscope. And here you can also maybe see the small, tiny micro pipet um, and how they are then conducted into the chamber. So what you might already observe is that uh, we come more or less planar or horizontal into the, um, into the chamber. So this is mainly important if you want to see what's happening in the pipet. So then you want to have everything in the focal plane. So that's why we try just to have always this kind of geometry. OK. And just from the what's happening, in fact, in type it. So why do we use this water connections and uh, hate? So in fact, everything plays with the principle of communicating vessels. So the one water level will be your sample, where the pipe is in. And the other side is the water bath. So now every difference in height between the water bath and your sample will generate a pressure difference at the pipe. And this is simply given by the, and the, the, the values are then just, okay, you multiply the density of water times the gravity you have and times the pressure, uh, the height difference and then you get the pressure difference. And this allows you to be in the range of Pascal. And that's quite nice because it's, uh, this pressure range is also the range where cells happen to have their normal uh, rigidities. And one other thing, so in the case of either cells or vesicles, so everything which has a, which you can somehow describe with the surface tension, uh, you can also apply Laplace law to get an idea how you uh, perturb or, or change the surface tension while aspirating your object. And this is this one. So in fact, the, the relation of pipette radius to the whole body radius gives you then how much you change the surface tension when you're applying when you're applying a certain suction pressure. And these are like the two more basic most basic principles you can use or you you should also be aware of when you're using uh, pipettes in connection with cells. And this is only and this is uh, true if you really can talk about the surface tension. Yeah. And um, just to be sure, the pressure difference is in fact the only thing you really set. Yeah, this is your independent variable yeah, for later. Everything else you have to measure or derive. Yeah, and so that's more or less this. So just now to, to show some examples what you can do and what people did in the past. Oh. Sorry. So in fact, this is 1976. Uh, sorry for the mistake. Um, yeah, so this is like one of the first things I found, but um, I think before, so there was something. But so Evans is one of the guys who used a lot of like micropipet. <coughs> and here you just see how he measured, in fact, red blood cells. And he checked how much does he get in at which 
pressures and you could then determine this is somehow related to the whole bending modulus of the whole uh, cell and it's a combination of the bilayer stretching modulus and the network which is below the bilayer. We could uh, distinct them in making diff uh, experiments at different conditions, uh, so different temperatures where you could say, okay, once we have both together and in the other conditions we don't have it together. And then he could just, in, in observing the percentage of membrane he gets into the pulpit in respect to the tension he applies, he could then determine what, what are the mechanical properties of those cells. So it's like very basic uh, measurements you can do, but you only need the pulpit for this. And the scale. <laughs> yeah. Is that the first paper then that described that technique? I cannot really say if it's the first paper, it's one of the first I know, but I didn't have the time not to totally look for stuff. Yeah, but um, I have to say, so maybe based also yeah, to so my... Cell membranes, that's perhaps the first patch cutting? No, no, I mean the use of suction... Patch clamping for sure, I, I think it was earlier, but... Um, And I can't really say yes because I didn't do a rough, uh, a real paper review or so something like that. Um, I just know that uh, the, like two, three big names are Stevens did a lot, and then there's Hochmut, who's another guy who did a lot with uh, Michael Pipet. And yeah, so these are also the two, the, the papers I show you. I mean, most of the time there's somewhere Evans and somewhere Hochmut. But the tension uh, measurement, I think, was Evans, right? Yeah. The first person who used aspiration to mm. determine the tension of a cell or a vesicle was pretty Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they did also most of the theory then. So I think yeah. they, they have to be one of the first. So, so it happened all like in the mid 70s, let's say, like this. It's yeah. So even though slow attack, it's fairly recent. Yeah. Do okay. Do the universe? <laughs> 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> And um, just to come back, I mean, to the forces, what I just mentioned with the level of forces you can apply and uh, you measure. So they, they use like dyne per centimeter, but uh, I mean, it is nanonewton per micrometer. And this is all like the things, the scales which you're working with. So um, for this, the micropipet is also really useful. And then a little bit more elaborated. Um, if you. So this is now used to, to just study not uh, composite material, which is a bit more complicated, but just uh, lipid bilayers and to get an idea, how do I change, so which lip, so the question was also, it is still, uh, which lipids uh, change in which kind the uh, bending proper probability is, uh, the, the properties of my memory. And um, so for this, you can nicely use the micropipet and you don't even need anything else than just micropipet and, and ma uh, scale again. Because um, you can relate the, and as I said, you can set the membrane tension in such a case. Here it's really clear cut because you don't have anything else. You only have membrane tension. And then you can relate the free area. So in fact, the area increase which happens if you increase the tension, you can relate this and you can measure this again and just measuring the, the length of your tongue and the change in radii of your uh, vesicle, but these are also related. So this, in fact, happens uh, due to fluctuations in the membrane. Uh, so energy which is stored in the fluctuations in the membrane. In fact, you can relate it then to um, the bending modulus and the stretching, uh, the bending rigidity and the stretching modulus of the membrane. And the nice thing is now, since here is a logarithmic term and this is linearly. In fact, you can separate now two regimes, the low tension regime and the high tension regime. And you can see on the um, high tension regime, you have this linear term, which is really high, strong. So you can take this part, take the slope, and you get an idea for the stretching modulus. And on a logarithmic scale, you take the first part of it, which is linear, and you get an idea about the bending modulus, bending rigidity. And this again, all just in uh, looking on length changes while aspirating a vesicle.
And as you see, it's not that old. I mean, it's like in the 90s they started and uh, improved this. And uh, you can even go a step further. Okay, first something else, sorry. <laughs> so also around 2000, uh, you can use the pipe us to do other things. For example, to extrude tubes from your cells. And I, I found this quite funny as an idea because uh, then you don't need any optical tweezers. Um, so what you can do, you can just bring some kind of bead into your pipette. And if you attach the bead to your, and here this is a neutrophil, you can just apply a force and you know the pressure, so that's a force because you know the diameter of the pipette, and you can extract the tube. And the tube radius and the force to pull a tube, they're again related to the uh, membrane properties. So in fact, here in the case, uh, it's again uh, the bending, the, the bending rigidity and the surface tension. So in this case, it is the adhesion energy of the membrane to the, to the cytoskeleton of the cell. And um, so they use this quite simple technique then to, to get an idea about the adhesion energy of membrane to the cytoskeleton. So it was a quite funny idea, I thought. And nowadays, uh, what we did in Paris also, we combined the, so this is the way how to combine in the micropapid with other techniques to make, in fact, a much stronger claims, I would say. Uh, so since the micropapid just doesn't need anything from the optical pathway and uh, it's just a device you can add, you can combine it with optical tweezers, you can put it on a confocal microscope, and unfortunately, yeah, the contrast is not that great. So in fact, what a colleague of mine did, he just used now the combination of micropipet and optical tweezers to, on one side, aspirate vesicle, and then impose a given stress on the surface. And on the other side, he pulled out a tube. And now, as I showed you also, I mean, as you, I didn't mention, but in fact, um, the tube radius is also related to the surface tension. In fact, there's a relation between, so this is all like vesicle stuff. Um, so if you have a vesicle, the, the force to pull a tube is related to, to P square root of 2 sigma kappa. So this is the surface tension. Yeah. And this is the bend bending rigidity. And the screw? Huh? The sigma the screw? It is. Oh, the sigma. Two P. Then square root of two sigma. Okay, square is equal to A two sigma. And uh, the radius of the tube is. Uh, I don't know where to put it. Sigma. 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 So if you put it in there, it should come out as two pi sigma. Yeah. Yeah. Two pi r. Yeah. So now, so if you combine this now, so if you now put a tube and at the other hand you set the surface tension, you can play with the radius of the tube. This is directly related to the surface tension. And then you can do things like. In this case, he checked now which lipids like to go into highly bent curvatures or regions. Or you can also check which proteins like to bind at which kind of uh, bent membrane. So, the fact, so I find this is a very nice combination of uh, optical tweezers and pipette. And then the confocal you can use just to check if your protein is binding or not and using fluorescent debated proteins. And another way I did, I used this also in combination. I just checked how membranes from cells react to stress and if they have any membrane reservoirs or not. So this you can also do if you want to go to more hype. Is it okay? Or? And if you know should cast all of it, it doesn't matter. Huh? Give it as a whole part. The kappa should cast all of it. Kappa should be? If you, I if think you it's kappa. Sigma. 
it should not take be the force of the high end. So the force it should just simply be too high up R times sigma. Yeah. 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 And so just stick it in there. It's not yeah, it's the other thing. Because it's. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. No, but the, the radius is not the kappa side. Yeah, so kappa should be on top. Yeah. But sigma also. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, kappa is dimension of energy. And sigma is dimension of energy divided by. <coughs> Um, okay, so this was when we go to vesicles and stuff. And um, one other thing you can just play around with the pipe it is, in fact, you can probe different things if you change the ratio between the and the, the, S, the ratio between the pipette radius and your cell radius. And here it's just an example where they check the mechanical properties of those those cells, chondral sites. <coughs> and in fact, if you if your ratio if, if your radius of the pipette is just a fraction of the cell. You can aspirate a part of the cell, or you can just detach a part of the membrane and measure those effects. Whereas if you're going close to the cell radius, you can check how they behave as a whole. So do they behave more like a liquid, dro liquid drop or not? And this gives you then ideas about the whole, uh, in fact, about the mechanical properties of the whole object. So here they just check at which pressure does this thing flow into the pipe. And they could just di distinct in different uh, effects for different, I mean, for, from patients in respect to uh, healthy persons. And a little bit a similar thing. You can also do, you can put, uh, you can just use the pipette to confine the movement of uh, amoeba, for example, or other cells which are crawling, or other organisms which are crawling. And then also you can check how much force do they exceed while moving. I mean, here in this case, they, they've put amoeba into the pipette, and there was two good things. So the one good thing, so amoeba has this blabbing kind of motion. And with this, they could just constrain the blab direction. And then they could check how much <coughs> does it move with, with every blab. And also, they could just impose different suction pressures and see how does the amoeba react. And when can I stall an amoeba? And this you can also do with other cells, crawling cells. So yeah, this is like just to give you the rough overview what you can do with uh, just a glass pipe and a water bath on a microscope. So, thank you. It's the trickiest part. Um, making the pipe so thin, I think. So, what also maybe the first workshop already realized is, um, so I told you, in fact, I, I didn't mention one point. Um, we are starting with this one millimeter pipette, glass capillaries, and in fact, we have to pull them and heat them and pull them. So we use so-called pipette pullers to get to 10 micrometer, five micrometer thick or thin uh, pipette openings. And to, if you just start from scratch to get the parameters correct to get this, this is already a bit tricky. But the second part is also that these tips are very fragile. And to install them on a microscope can be a bit tricky and you need a good hand for it because they break very easily. Then you could go like this to get that liner? No, normally you just uh, come, in come in. I mean, normally you make like a chamber which is just 
open on the side, for example. So you just stick two glass lights together with the spacer. And then you come in with the pocket. So normally they look like this. You normally try to handle it symmetrically. And then you are maybe slightly angled, but not very much. And the hardest part at the beginning is to get this into this, and then to find this needle with the 100x upgrade. So the needle has that. Yeah, if you don't know your system yet, so for the first time you're like, hours later, oh, I found it. Oh, it's broken. <laughs> but uh, that's the most, if you have some experience, then it goes much faster. What about the end? Uh, it's not straight. Because when you break it, it most often becomes straight, but not really exactly straight. So um, if your pulling program is nice and well, uh, you get a nice easy straight end. Uh, is, it is it a problem? Hmm? If for some reason it's not quite straight, is it a problem? Yeah, the problem is that you're not really sure if you see a really when you're cycling. Yeah. Okay. As soon as you don't have the sealed end, you don't know what pressure you exactly have got. Because mm -hmm. any hole, and then there's still some flow, then you will have a fraction of it. Lose uh, suction pressure for yourself. Yeah. So you see also, the, the damage risk and the, you see something on it is much higher. So, normally, you um, either you have a good pulling program or you make a second step where you're forging the. You know, and it's kind of a. Um, so, what we use is uh, we use on a microscope, we watch and the objective is like this. You watch this thing. Come down with the pocket, and here you have a glass rock which is connected to a filament. So you can heat the filament, and this the bottom part is under this glass has a lower melting temperature than the pocket glass. And you can really nicely dip in as much of the pipe as you want so that you can open it at the right point. And this cutting point is important. You have a lot of problems. Oh, sorry. You have a lot of problems with uh, if you put the pipe in your solution, it just gets dirty. It's just all kind of crap that is floating around in your in your medium goes. Yeah. So the resistance to your pipe is. Yeah. So uh, one major part is that it should be as clean as possible. <laughs> and the second part is that you acidate your pipe, so you coat it with some protein like. Casein, uh, for example, or BSH. Um, and yeah, the other part is really that you try to be in a quite clean solution. So the moment it is contaminated, you basically can start all over doing the, the tricky part? The yeah, the moment you get something inside the open, something here, but here you can probably forget it. And if you want to make imaging, even anything you can see is. I forget it. But if you pass it, it's only quite okay. And to clean it, I mean, sometimes they're not really sticking, and for cleaning, you have to do syringe, which you can make a strong push and you blow through. You, you don't blow up the, the end part? No, no, no. Yeah. So, you took a minimal uh, changes to a micro injection setup if you do want to spend. So yeah. the setup is there to inject mounts those sites, essentially aside, instead of having the injection bit more. Yeah, exactly that's what we did here. I just replaced it. So the injection apparatus is more about giving positive pressure. So this machine has only pumps, it can create pressure. Um, and then you just have to disconnect from that and put it on a water bath and it's fine. Yeah, you can use all of it. And in general, they are more built to be on a high angle input because you make the injections like this, which is not ideal if you want to see what happens when you spray it something. So there you might have to do some modifications to get it a, a more horizontal plane. But otherwise, yeah, principally, you can use this. How can you control the tension of activity? The pressure. Um, yeah, so you are in the multimeter range, so you are about the uh, 1.02 RCRs. 
So in the 0.1 cluster range. Then what you should, should take into account some calculations. I, mean, I would say it's around cluster. It can be precise. Uh, and the high component can be in micrometers. And if you're sure that you don't have any evaporation of the stuff and that the tubing are not fluctuating, because if you get vibration in tubes, gives you also vibration of the pressure, then you can be uh, quite accurate. Modulus of elasticity varies here, especially. Pardon? Oh, the elasticity varies modulus. Yeah. So how accurate is compared to other techniques? So how much you can relay on the value that you are getting? Um, I have to say I didn't check how what other people measure on this. Versus. So there are many techniques. Yeah, yeah. So um, the fluctuation analysis, etc. So compared to other values, so how accurate this value you can? Is how, how much uh, the percentage error we can expect from the actual value? Good question. And sometimes they are quite. I, I didn't really check on this. Um, so the young modules, I don't think it's super accurate because you make a lot of assumptions. Mm. And at the end, it's just how precise can you detect it optically. So I think at that time it was lower, maybe lower precision than nowadays. And but, uh, I think this is more accurate than the fluctuation. It might be, yeah. But the, the, the most important is that you just use of different techniques. This is another way you can 